but they were needed if he was going to keep on casting the air pocket, which he might have to do if they kept up at this slow pace. And the Guilo didn't notice, anyway. You're not in China, are you? The Guilo asked. Not exactly, he said, looking out the window at the sky over Orange County, the most boring zip code in California. Where are you guys? They're in China. Where I live, you can see the Disneyland fireworks show every night. God damn, the Guilo said. Ain't you got better things to do than help some idiot level up in the middle of the night? I guess I don't, he said. Mixed in behind were the guys laughing and catcalling in Chinese on their channel. He grinned to hear them. I mean, hell. I can see why someone in China'd do a crappy job for a rotten 75 bucks, but if you're in America, dude, you should have some pride, get some real work. And why would someone in China want to do a crappy job? The guys were listening in now. They didn't have great English, but they spoke enough to get by. You know. It's China. There's billions of them. Poor as dirt and ignorant. I don't blame them. You can't blame them. It's not their fault. But hell, once you get out of China and get to America, you should act like an American. We don't do that kind of work. What makes you think I got out of China? Didn't you? I was born here. My parents were born here. Their parents were born here. Their parents came here from Russia. I didn't know they had Chinese in Russia. Wei Dong laughed. I'm not Chinese, dude. You aren't. Well, goddamn then. I'm sorry. I figured you were. What are you, then, the boss or something? Wei Dong closed his eyes and counted to ten. When he opened them again. The carpenters had swum out of the wrecked galleon before them, their T-squares and saws at the ready. They moved by building wooden boxes and gates around themselves, which acted as barricades, and they worked fast. On the land, you could burn their timbers, but that didn't work under the sea. Once they had you boxed in, they drove long nails through boards around you. It was a grisly, slow way to die. Of course, they had the Guilo surrounded in a flash, and they all had to pile on to fight them free. Shang summoned his familiar, a boar, and Wei Dong spelled it its own air bubble and it set to work, tearing up the planks with its tusks. When at last the carpenters managed to kill it, it turned into a baby and floated, lifeless, to the ocean's surface, accompanied by a ghostly weeping. Savage Wonderland looked like it was all laughs, but it was really grim when you got down to it, and the puzzles were hard and the big bosses were really hard. Speaking of bosses, they put down the last of the carpenters and as they did, a swirling current disturbed the sea bottom, kicking up sand that settled slowly, revealing the vorpal blade and armor, encrusted in barnacles. And the Guilo gave a whoop and a holler and dove for it clumsily, as they all shouted at once for him to stop, to wait, and then, and then he triggered the trap that they all knew was there. And then there was trouble. The Jabberwock did indeed have eyes of flame, and it did make a burbling sound, just like it said in the poem. But the Jabberwock did a lot more than give you dirty looks and belch. The Jabberwock was mean, it soaked up a lot of damage, and it gave as good as it got. It was fast, too, faster than the carpenters, so one minute you could be behind it and then it would do a barrel roll, its tail like a whip, cracking and knocking back anything that got in its way, and it would be facing you, rearing up with its spindly claws splayed, its narrow chest heaving. The jaws that bite, the claws that catch, and once they'd caught you, the jabberwock would beat you against the hardest surface in reach, doing insane damage while you squirmed to get free. And the burbling. Not so much like burping, really, more like the sound of meat going through a grinder, a nasty sound. A bloody sound. The first time Wei Dong had managed to kill a jabberwock, after a weekend's continuous play, he'd crashed hard and had nightmares about that sound. Nice going. Jackass. Wei Dong said as he hammered on his keyboard, trying to get all his spells up and running without getting disemboweled by the nightmare beast before them. It had Lu and was beating the ever-loving piss out of him, but that was okay, it was just Lu, his job was to get beaten up. Wei Dong cast his healing spells at Lu while he swam back as fast as he could. Now, that's not nice, the Guilo said. How the hell was I supposed to know? Dash quote dot. You weren't. You didn't know. You don't know. That's the point. That's why you hired us. Now we're going to use up all our spells and potions fighting this thing. He broke off for a second and hit some more keys, and it's going to take days to get it all back. Just because you couldn't wait at the back like you were supposed to. I don't have to take this, the Guilo said. I'm a customer, damn it. You want to be a dead customer, buddy, Wei Dong said. 
He'd barely had any time to talk with his Gildees on the whole raid. He'd been stuck talking to this dumb English speaker. Now the guy was mouthing off to him. It made him want to throw his computer against the wall. See what being nice gets you. If the Guilo replied. Wei Dong didn't hear it because the Jabberwock was really pouring on the heat. He was out of potions and healing spells and Lu wasn't going to last much longer. Oh, crap. It had Ping in its other claw now, and it was worrying at his armor with a long fang, trying to peel him like a grape. He tabbed over to his voice chat controller and dialed up the Chinese channel to full, tuning out the guilo. It was a chaos of fast, profane dialect, slangy Chinese that mixed in curse words from Japanese comics and Indian movies. The boys were all hollering. Too fast for him to get more than the sense of things. There was Ping, though, calling for him. Leonard. Healing. I'm out, he said, hating how this was all going. I'm totally empty. Used it all up on Lu. That's it then, Ping said. We're dead. They all howled with disappointment. In spite of himself. Wei Dong grinned. You think he'll reschedule, or are we going to have to give him his money back? Wei Dong didn't know, but he had a feeling that this goober wasn't going to be very cooperative if they told him that he'd gotten up in the middle of the night for nothing. Even if it was his fault. He sucked in some whistling breaths through his nose and tried to calm down. It was almost 2 a.m. now. In the house around him, all was silent. A car revved its engine somewhere far away, but the night was so quiet the sound carried into his bedroom. Okay, he said. Okay, let me do something about this. Every game had a couple of BFGs. Big friendly guns, or at least some kind of big gun, that were nearly impossible to get and nearly impossible to resist. In Savage Wonderland, they were also nearly impossible to reload, the rare monster blunderbuss that you had to spend months gathering parts for fired huge loads of sharpened cutlery from the tea party, and just collecting enough for a single load took eight or nine hours of gameplay. Impossible to get, impossible to load. Practically no one had one. But Wei Dong did. Ignoring the shouting in his headset, he backed off to the edge of the blunderbuss's range and began to arm it, a laborious process of dumping all that cutlery into the muzzle. Get in front of it, he said. In front of it. Now. His guildies could see what he was doing now and they were whooping triumphantly, arraying their tunes around its front, occupying its attention, clearing his line of fire. All he needed was one dot more dot second. He pulled the trigger. There was a snap and a hiss as the powder in the pan began to burn. The sound made the Jabberwock turn its head on its long, serpentine neck. It regarded him with its burning eyes and it dropped Ping and Lu to the ocean bed. The powder in the pan flared, and died. Misfire. Oh crap a crap a crap, he muttered, hammering, hammering on the rearm sequence, his fingers a blur on the mouse buttons. Crap 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 crap. The Jabberwock smiled, and made that wet meaty sound again. Burble burble, little boy. I'm coming for you. It was the sound from his nightmare, the sound of his dream of heroism dying. The sound of a waste of a day's worth of ammo and a night's worth of play. He was a dead man. The Jabberwock did one of those whipping, rippling barrel rolls that were its trademark. The currents buffeted him, sending him rocking from side to side. He corrected, overcorrected, corrected again. Hit the rearm button. The fire button, the rearm button, the fire button. The Jabberwock was facing him now. It reared back, flexing its claws, clicking its jaws together. In a second it would be on him, it would open him from crotch to throat and eat his guts, any second now, crash. The sound of the blunderbuss was like an explosion in a pots and pans drawer, a million metallic clangs and bangs as the sea was sliced by a rapidly expanding cone of lethal, screaming metal tableware. The Jabberwock dissolved, ripped into a slowly rising mushroom of meat and claws and leathery scales. The left side of its head ripped toward him and bounced off him, settling in the sand. The water turned pink, then red, and the death screech of the Jabberwock seemed to carry him off the water and lap back over him again and again. It was a fantastic sound. His guildies were going nuts, 7,000 miles away, screaming his name, and not Leonard, but Wei Dong, chanting it in their internet cafe off Jobin Road in Shenzhen. Wei Dong was grinning ferociously in his bedroom, basking in it. And when the water cleared, there again were the vorpal blade and helmet in their crust of barnacles, sitting innocently on the ocean floor. The Guilo, the Guilo. He'd forgotten all about the Guilo, moved clumsily toward it. 
I don't think so, said Ping, in pretty good English. His tune moved so fast that the Guilo probably didn't even see him coming. Ping's sword went snicker-snack, and the Guilo's head fell to the sand, a dumb, betrayed expression on its face. What the? Dash quote dot. Wei Dong dropped him from the chat. That's your treasure, brother, Ping said. You earned it. But the money. Dash quote dot. We can make the money tomorrow night. That was killer, dude. It was one of Ping's favorite English phrases, and it was the highest praise in their guild. And now he had a vorpal blade and helmet. It was a good night. They surfaced and paddled to shore and conjured up their mounts again and rode back to the guild hall, chatting all the way, dispatching the occasional minor beast without much fuss. The guys weren't too put out at being 75 bucks poorer than they'd expected. They were players first, business people second. And that had been fun. And now it was 2.30 and he'd have to be up for school in four hours, and at this rate, he was going to be lying awake for a long time. Okay, I'm going to go guys, he said, in his best Chinese. They bade him farewell, and the chat channel went dead. In the sudden silence of his room, he could hear his pulse pounding in his ears. And another sound, a tread on the floor outside his door. A hand on the doorknob, crap crap crap. He manged to get the lid of the laptop down and his covers pulled up before the door opened, but he was still holding the machine under the sheets, and his father's glare from the doorway told him that he wasn't fooling anyone. Wordlessly, still glaring, his father crossed the room and delicately removed the earwig from Wei Dong's ear. It glowed telltale blue, blinking, looking for the laptop that was now sleeping under Wei Dong's artistically redecorate Spongebob sheets. Dad, he began. Leonard. It's 2.30 in the morning. I'm not going to discuss this with you right now. But we're going to talk about it in the morning. And you're going to have a long, long time to think about it afterward. He yanked back the sheet and took the laptop out of Wei Dong's now limp hand. Dad, he said, as his father turned and left the room, but his father gave no indication he'd heard before he pulled the bedroom door firmly and authoritatively shut. Hash. This scene is dedicated to Borderlands books. San Francisco's magnificent independent science fiction bookstore. Borderlands is not just notorious for its brilliant events, signings, book clubs and such, but also for its amazing hairless Egyptian cat. Ripley, who likes to perch like a buzzing gargoyle on the computer at the front of the store. Borderlands is about the friendliest bookstore you could ask for, filled with comfy places to sit and read, and staffed by incredibly knowledgeable clerks who know everything there is to know about science fiction. Even better. They've always been willing to take orders for my book by net or phone and hold them for me to sign when I drop into the store, then they ship them within the U.S. for free. Borderlands Books. 866 Valencia Avenue. San Francisco, California, USA 94110 plus 1 888 Begin underscore of underscore the underscore Skype underscore highlighting plus 1 888 End underscore of underscore the underscore Skype underscore highlighting. Mala missed the bird calls. When they'd lived in the village. There'd been birdsong every morning, breaking the perfect peace of the night to let them know that the sun was rising and the day was beginning. That was when she'd been a little girl. Here in Mumbai, there were some sickly rooster calls at dawn, but they were nearly drowned out by the never-ending traffic song, the horns, the engines revving, the calls late in the night. In the village, there'd been the bird calls, the silence, and peace. Times when everyone wasn't always watching. In Mumbai, there was nothing but the people, the people everywhere, so that every breath you breathed tasted of the mouth that had exhaled it before you got it. She and her mother and her brother slept together in a tiny room over Mr. Kunal's plastic recycling factory in Dharavi, the huge squatter's slum at the north end of the city. During the day, the room was used to sort plastic into a dozen tubs, the plastic coming from an endless procession of huge rice sacks that were filled at the shipyards. The ships went to America and Europe and Asia filled with goods made in India and came back filled with garbage, plastic that the pickers of Dharavi sorted, cleaned, melted and reformed into pellets and shipped to the factories so that they could be turned into manufactured goods and shipped back to America, Europe and Asia. When they'd arrived at Dharavi, Mala had found it terrifying. The narrow shacks growing up to blot out the sky. 
the dirt lanes between them with gutters running in iridescent blue and red from the dye shops, the choking always smell of burning plastic, the roar of motorbikes racing between the buildings. And the eyes, eyes from every window and roof, all watching them as Mamaji led her and her little brother to the factory of Mr. Kunal, where they were to live now and forevermore. But barely a year had gone by and the smell had disappeared. The eyes had become friendly. She could hop from one lane to another with perfect confidence, never getting lost on her way to do the marketing or to attend the afternoon classes at the little school room over the restaurant. The sorting work had been boring, but never hard, and there was always food, and there were other girls to play with, and Mamaji had made friends who helped them out. Piece by piece. She'd become a Dharavi girl, and now she looked on the newcomers with a mixture of generosity and pity. And the work, well, the work had gotten a lot better, just lately. It started when she was in the games cafe with Yasmin, stealing an hour after lessons to spend a few rupees of the money she'd saved from her pay packet almost all of it went to the family, of course, but Mamaji sometimes let her keep some back and advised her to spend it on a treat at the corner shop. Yasmin had never played zombie mecha, but of course they'd both seen the movies at the little filmy house on the road that separated the Muslim and the Hindu sections of Dharavi. Mala loved zombie mecha, and she was good at it. Two, she preferred the PvP servers where players could hunt other players. Trying to topple their giant mecha suits so that the zombies around them could swarm over it, crack open its cockpit cowl and feast on the avenue within. Most of the girls at the game cafe came in and played little games with cute animals and trading for hearts and jewels. But for Mala, the action was in the awesome carnage of the multiplayer war games. It only took a few minutes to get Yasmin through the basics of piloting her little squadron and then she could get down to tactics. That was it, that was what none of the other players seemed to understand. Tactics were everything. They treated the game like it was a random chaos of screeching rockets and explosions, a confusion to be waded into and survived, as best as you could. But for Mala, the confusion was something that happened to other people. For Mala, the explosions and camera shake and the screech of the zombies were just minor details, to be noted among the big picture, the armies arrayed on the battlefield in her mind. On that battlefield, the massed forces took on a density and a color that showed where their strengths and weaknesses were, how they were joined to each other and how pushing one this one, over here, would topple that one over there. You could face down your enemies head-on, rockets against rockets, guns against guns, and then the winner would be the luckier one, or the one with the most ammo, or the one with the best shields. But if you were smart, you didn't have to be lucky, or tougher. Mala liked to lob rockets and grenades over the opposing armies, to their left and right, creating box canyons of rubble and debris that blocked their escape. Meanwhile, a few of her harriers would be off in the weeds aggroing huge herds of zombies, getting them really mad, gathering them up until they were like locusts, blotting out the ground in all directions, leading them ever closer to that box canyon. Just before they'd come into view, her frontal force would peel off, running away in a seeming act of cowardice. Her enemies would be buoyed up by false confidence and give chase, until they saw the harriers coming straight for them, with an unstoppable, torrential pestilence of zombies hot on their heels. Most times, they were too shocked to do anything. Not even fire at the harriers as they ran straight for their lines and threw them, into the one escape left behind in the box canyon, blowing the crack shut as they left. Then it was just a matter of waiting for the zombies to overwhelm and devour your opponents, while you snickered and ate a sweet and drank a little tea from the urn by the cashier's counter. The sounds of the zombies rending the armies of her enemies and gnawing their bones was particularly satisfying. Yasmin had been distracted by the zombies, the disgusting entrails. The shining rockets. But she'd seen, oh yes. She'd seen how Mullah's strategies were able to demolish much larger opposing armies and she got over her squeamishness. And so on they played, drawing an audience, first the hooting derisive boys who fell silent when they watched the armies fall before her, and who started to call her General Robotwala without even a hint of mockery, and then the girls, shy at first, peeking over the boys' shoulders. Then shoving forward and cheering and beating their fists on the walls and stamping their feet for each dramatic victory. It wasn't cheap, though. Mala's carefully hoarded store of rupees shrank, buffered somewhat by a few coins from other players who paid her a little here and there to teach them how to really play. 
She knew she could have borrowed the money, or let some boy spend it on her, there was already fierce competition for the right to go over the road to the drinkswalla and buy her a masala coke, a fizzing, foaming spicy explosion of coke and masala spice and crushed ice that soothed the rawness at the back of her throat that had been her constant companion since they'd come to Dharavi. But nice girls from the village didn't let boys buy them things. Boys wanted something in return. She knew that, knew it from the movies and from the life around her. She knew what happened to girls who let boys take care of their needs. There was always a reckoning. When the strange man first approached her, she thought about nice girls and boys and what they expected, and she wouldn't talk to him or meet his eye. She didn't know what he wanted, but he wasn't going to get it from her. So when he got up from his chair by the cashier as she came into the café, rose and crossed to intercept her with his smart linen suit and good shoes and short, neatly oiled hair, and small mustache. She'd stepped around him, stepped past him, pretended she didn't hear him say, Excuse me, miss, and miss. Miss. Please, just a moment of your time. But Mrs. Daibayendu, the owner of the café, shouted at her. Mala, you listen to this man, you listen to what he has to say to you. You don't be rude in my shop. No you don't, and because Mrs. Daibayendu was also from a village, and because her mother had said that Mala could play games but only in Mrs. Daibayendu's café. Mrs. Daibayendu being the sort of person you could trust not to allow improper doings, or drugs, or violence, or criminality. Mala stopped and turned to the man, silent, expecting. Ah, he said. Thank you. He nodded to Mrs. Daibayendu. Thank you. He turned back to her, and to the army of boys and girls who'd gathered around her, her army, the ones who called her General Robotwala and meant it. I hear that you are a very good player, he said. Mala waggled her chin back and forth. Half closing her eyes, letting her chin say. Yes, I'm a good player, and I'm good enough that I don't need to boast about it. Is she a good player? Mala turned to her army, who had the discipline to remain silent until she gave them the nod. She waggled her chin at them, go on. And they erupted in an enthused babble, extolling the virtues of their general Robotwala, the epic battles they'd fought and won against impossible odds. I have some work for good players. Mala had heard rumors of this. You represent a league. The man smiled a little smile and shook his head. He smelled of citrusy cologne and beetle, a sweet combination of smells she'd never smelled before. No not a league. You know that in the game. There are players who don't play for fun. Players who play to make money. The kind of money you're offering to us. His chin waggled and he chuckled. No not exactly. There are players who play to build up game money, which they sell on to other players who are too lazy to do the playing for themselves. Mala thought about this for a moment. The containers went out of India filled with goods and came back filled with garbage for Dharavi. Somewhere out there, in the America of the filmy shows. There was a world of people with unimaginable wealth. We'll do it, she said. I've already got more credits than I can spend. How much do they pay for them? Again, the chuckle. Actually, he said. Then stopped. Her army was absolutely silent now, hanging on his every word. From the machines came the soft crashing of the wars, taking place in the world inside the network, all day and all night long. Actually, that's not exactly it. We want you and your friends to destroy them. Kill their AVS. Take their fortunes. Mala thought for another instant. Puzzled. Who would want to kill these other players? Your arrival. The man waggled his chin. Maybe yes, maybe no. She thought some more. You work for the game, she said. You work for the game and you don't want. Dash quote dot. Who I work for isn't important, the man said, holding up his fingers. He wore a wedding ring on one hand, and two gold rings on the other. He was missing the top joints on three of his fingers, she saw. That was common in the village, where farmers were always getting caught in the machines. Here was a man from a village, a man who'd come to Mumbai and become a man in a neat suit with a neat mustache and gold rings glinting on what remained of his fingers. Here was the reason her mother had brought them to Dharavi. The reason for the sore throat and the burning eyes and the endless work over the plastic sorting tubs. What's important is that we would pay you and your friends. Dash quote dot. My army, she said, interrupting him without thinking. For a moment his eyes flashed dangerously and she sensed that he was about to slap her, but she stood her ground. She'd been slapped plenty before. He snorted once through his nose, then went on. Yes. 
Mala, your army. We would pay you to destroy these players. You'd be told what sort of mecha they were piloting, what their player names were, and you'd have to root them out and destroy them. You'd keep all their wealth, and you'd get rupees, too. How much? He made a pained expression, like he had a little gas. Perhaps we should discuss that in private, later. With your mother present. Mala noticed that he didn't say. Your parents, but rather. Your mother, Mrs. Daibuyendu and he had been talking, then. He knew about Mala, and she didn't know about him. She was just a girl from the village, after all, and this was the world, where she was still trying to understand it all. She was a general, but she was also a girl from the village. General girl from the village. So he'd come that night to Mr. Kunal's factory, and Mala's mother had fed him tali and papadams from the women's papadam collective, and they'd boiled chai in the electric kettle and the man had pretended that his fine clothes and gold belonged here, and had squatted back on his heels like a man in the village, his hairy ankles peeking out over his socks. No one Mala knew wore socks. Mr. Banerjee, Mamaji said. I don't understand this, but I know Mrs. Daibayendu. If she says you can be trusted. She trailed off, because really. She didn't know Mrs. Daibayendu. In Dharavi, there were many hazards for a young girl. Mamaji would fret over them endlessly while she brushed out Mala's hair at night, all the ways a girl could find herself ruined or hurt here. But the money. A lack of rupees every month, he said. Plus a bonus. Of course. She'll have to pay her army. He'd given Mala a little chin waggle at that, see. I remember, out of that. But how much would be up to her? These children wouldn't have any money if it wasn't for my Mala, Mamaji said, affronted at their imaginary grasping hands. They're only playing a game. They should be glad just to play with her, Mamaji had been furious when she discovered that Mala had been playing at the cafe all these afternoons. She thought that Mala only played once in a while. Not with every rupee and moment she had spare. But when the man, Mr. Banerjee, had mentioned her talent and the money it could earn for the family, suddenly Mamaji had become her daughter's business manager. Mala saw that Mr. Banerjee had known this would happen and wondered what else Mrs. Daibayendu had told him about their family. Mamaji, she said, quietly, keeping her eyes down in the way they did in the village. They're my army, and they need paying if they play well. Otherwise they won't be my army for long. Mamaji looked hard at her. Beside them, Mala's little brother Gopal took advantage of their distraction to sneak the last bit of eggplant off Mala's plate. Mala noticed, but pretended she hadn't, and concentrated on keeping her eyes down. Mamaji said, Now, Mala, I know you want to be good to your friends, but you have to think of your family first. We will find a fair way to compensate them, maybe we could prepare a weekly feast for them here, using some of the money. I'm sure they could all use a good meal. Mala didn't like to disagree with her mother, and she'd never done so in front of strangers, but, but this was her army, and she was their general. She knew what made them tick, and they'd heard Mr. Banerjee announce that she would be paid in cash for their services. They believed in fairness. They wouldn't work for food while she worked for a lakh, a lakh, 100.000 rupees. The whole family lived on 200 rupees a day, of cash. Mamaji, she said. It wouldn't be right or fair. It occurred to Mala that Mr. Banerjee had mentioned the money in front of the army. He could have been more discreet. Perhaps it was deliberate. And they'd know it. I can't earn this money for the family on my own. Mamaji. Her mother closed her eyes and breathed through her nose, a sign that she was trying to keep hold of her temper. If Mr. Banerjee hadn't been present. Mala was sure she would have gotten a proper beating, the kind she'd gotten from her father before he left them, when she was a naughty little girl in the village. But if Mr. Banerjee wasn't here, she wouldn't have to talk back to her mother, either. I'm sorry for this. Mr. Banerjee, Mamaji said. Not looking at Mala. Girls of this age, they become rebellious, impossible. Mala thought about a future in which instead of being General Robotwala, 